Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this Plastics Master Class with Cody Kaufman. We're happy you're here. And Cody, thank you so much for coming and presenting today. Absolutely. Thank you for, uh, for giving me the opportunity. This is going to be fun. Absolutely. Um, so before, while we're waiting for people to log in, I want to ask you um, a question I'm sure other people want to know too. What made you decide to be in this industry? Wow, uh, that's a good one. Uh, maybe maybe Providence, I don't know, maybe fate. <laughs> I got into it uh, right out of high school, actually. Um, just started working for a plastics manufacturing company and uh, found out very early on how interesting and, and unique plastic processing is and just how, how cool and, and uh, uh, just fun uh, plastics are to work with. So here we are now, almost 20 years later, uh, <laughs> I haven't left and uh, I don't think I plan on leaving. So yeah, that's, that's well, how it happened. Awesome, well, we're happy you haven't left and that you're here today. <laughs> And um, before we get started uh, into the ed educational part of the presentation, I want to do some housekeeping for you guys. Um, this is our Seal Connect classroom. It's non-branded, non-promotional educational webinars from SEPCO experts, but also experts um, in, in the industry like Tom Wilk from Plant Services has presented with us and uh, Captain Unreliability. Uh, who also writes for Plant Services has been with us. And um, if you want to join our chat on social media, use the hashtag SealConnect. Um, we will have time um, for questions at the end, so send them to us now. Um, if it's something that's super like timely, I will jump in and ask Cody right away, and um, otherwise we'll hold them to the end. On the right-hand side in the panel, you'll see a handout section. We've got three handouts for you to download. There's a brochure on some of the materials, and there is a case study and uh, another info sheet. So if you'd like to download those, please do. You can ask your questions in the questions section on the right-hand panel. Um, and we are recording the webinar. And when we send the, the link out to you for the recording, we'll also send you a PDF of the slide deck. So you'll have the slides, you'll have the recording, um, but definitely stay with us so you can ask your questions at the end. And um, Cody, I'm going to hand it off to you. And if anybody needs anything, y'all just let us know. Great. Yeah. So yeah, my name is Cody Kaufman. I, um, sorry, uh, I've been in the polymer industry uh, for nearly 20 years now. Uh, I've worked uh, for both finished part and raw material manufacturers. Uh, so I've had the opportunity uh, to manufacture and sell these products we're gonna talk about today from uh, really from all stages um, of, of the process, raw materials to finished parts. Um, industrial and high performance plastics is, is still a growing market uh, that has endless possibilities uh, and lots of interesting challenges, uh, which is why I've uh, I've stayed hooked on it for uh, nearly two decades now. Um, so I hope after this presentation, you will be uh, as excited uh, about plastics as I am. So uh, let's, uh, let's, let's, I guess we'll start, start at the beginning. Um, the agenda that we're gonna be kind of going through uh, is how machine plastic parts are made. We're gonna be looking at it from, really from the raw materials through the compounds. Um, to the finished products. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, PTFE materials uh, and, and compounded PTFE materials, uh, PET-based materials. Uh, these would be internally lubricated uh, materials, uh, PPS, uh, linear and branched materials, uh, PBIs. These are high-performance, high-temp uh, materials. And then we have a few uh, additional kind of composite materials and, and a few other compounds, kind of industry standard stuff that we're going to be talking through with strengths and, and uh, and weaknesses of. Uh, and then we'll have some time for, for questions at the end. So if you have any questions as we're going along, please shoot those over to Lori and uh, uh, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll answer those as we go or certainly at the end. So a little poll question to start us out uh, this morning. Why uh, did you decide to attend uh, this webinar? Uh, did you want to learn more about industrial plastics? Do you want to be able to sell uh, industrial plastics? Uh, do you want to sound uh, better informed about industrial plastics? Or is there 
some other reason. Uh, so let us know, answer that poll question, and we can help uh, cater uh, this uh, to you guys. And we have launched the poll, so hopefully everyone can give this an answer. Don't be shy. <laughs> We are not getting any action on our poll. Hopefully everyone can hear us and um, we'll jump in and answer this. There we go, we got some answers now. Um, all right, I'm going to um, close the poll now and I'll share the results. So 50%, well, I lost my results. 50% want to learn more about industrial plastic than 50% want to sound better informed. So okay. there we go. Good, good. Well, that's great. Um, yeah, hopefully uh, we will learn more and uh, you will be better informed uh, at the end of this. You absolutely will be. So let's, uh, let's start at the beginning. Um, all plastics, uh, start out as a raw or virgin powder, depending uh, depending on the final application, um, are either processed in that unaltered state, uh, or they're combined with various fillers uh, or additives to enhance the properties or performance. Uh, for the purpose of this discussion this morning, we're going to be focusing mostly on uh, the enhanced or composite versions, the compounded versions of these materials. Um, so, but but just know that as we go through it, um, these materials can either be left in their virgin or uh, unaltered state or, or compounded uh, into uh, workable materials. Um, most all compounds are, are made by mechanically combine, combining um, fillers with base polymers. And so when I say mechanically uh, combined, I mean that uh, the compound is made uh, by mixing fillers and pigments uh, in with those raw base polymers. Uh, I think that the best way to think about that process is uh, like making a smoothie in a blender. Certainly you don't want to <laughs> consume these products, but, but smoothies uh, in a blender, the ingredients are all put into a vessel together and with sharp uh, spinning blades, they incorporate all these ingredients uh, together. Um, so nothing is really happening at a, on a molecular level at that point. Everything is just being equally combined together. Um, the, the mixers that are often used for this process and that we, we use here are, look and function very much the same uh, as a blender you would have at home, uh, just bigger and, um, and more powerful. So that's how the raw material compounds are formed and then the next step uh, as you see is we go to billets. Uh, once you um, have a compound then you can further process it into uh, a, a usable shape uh, and this uh, process of taking a raw compound and, and taking it to a billet uh, or a rod or a tube it involves uh, high pressure uh, sometimes pressure combined with heat uh, to form a compound uh, or to form the compound and, uh, and mold it into a, a desired shape. Uh, so this is also uh, during this uh, forming process, taking the raw material to a billet. Um, this is when the compound coalesces uh, from a molecular standpoint. So this is when um, the material uh, takes its shape essentially. Like uh, think about it as adding um, uh, water to concrete. Um, the heat and the pressure from this uh, billet formation actually fuses the polymer and the additives together, creating this solid workable material. Um, so how hard that material is, how hard that billet is, how hard that rod or tube is, uh, and what properties it has depend both on um, the quality of the processing and the uh, types and amounts of additives. Um, that were used. So that gets us to now to the point where we can take that billet and, and that uh, that shape and um, and convert it into a finished seal, a bushing, gasket, lantern ring, etc. So that's what we're going to spend 
really the rest of our time talking about this morning is um, these finished products, their strengths, their weaknesses, applications, where these materials would be best suited. Uh, so almost all of these materials we're going to discuss this morning are industry standard materials. They're not proprietary to any specific company, so you're going to undoubtedly uh, run into these materials really just about anywhere you go. So if you have questions um, about the material progression, the compounding, the molding process, anything like that, um, as we move into the, the next, uh, the bulk of the presentation, uh, don't hesitate, drop those questions in um, and we're yeah, happy to make some time to, uh, to answer any of those questions. So we're gonna then move on and we'll, uh, oh, we got a poll question, another poll question here. Uh, question is, what industry or industries are you in? Are you in pulp and paper, oil, gas, ethanol, uh, food, beverage, water, wastewater, uh, or again, other? All right, we're launching the poll now, and we'll give people time to vote. You can pick more than one um, industry. And if you pick other, shoot those to us either in the chat or in the question section so we know what other um, industries you're in. And we'll leave this up for about 30 seconds. So please go ahead and answer the poll if you don't mind. And we're definitely getting some answers coming in now. Would like to have a few more responses before we close it. So we only have a few people who have voted. There we go, we're getting some more in. All right, we will close the poll. And let me share the results with you. So we have 50% pulp and paper, 100% are in um, the oil, gas, ethanol, and other biofuels, okay. and 50% in food and beverage. So food, beverage, oil, gas, ethanol, and pulp and paper are Great. our main, um, main industries here. And I'll close this out. Great. And we'll hop to the next slide. Okay, yeah, thank you all for that. Um, so yeah, we're moving in. Uh, so a lot of this stuff will then apply um, certainly to uh, oil and gas industry, well, but all those industries in which y'all y'all answered the poll questions on. So um, so first, uh, let's move into where, where and friction um, grade materials. So these uh, next probably half a dozen or so different materials are all gonna be uh, PTFE based. Um, specifically, we'll talk first about these wear and friction grade materials. So this would be um, co cover a lot or a bulk of the rotating, reciprocating applications um, that you guys are going to run into, um, guys and gals are going to run into uh, frequently. So um, as you know, PTFE is a high density um, material resistant to high temperatures. Uh, PTFE based materials are versatile. Uh, and they're ideal for a lot of different applications. Uh, PTFE materials, uh, when they're white, uh, generally are, are considered FDA uh, compliant. Uh, PTFE is uh, often considered more of a commodity product now, but uh, it's still very much a high performance industrial plastic material that, um, that, that we, use, we use frequently and it's continued uh, to be a staple in the industry. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, so some applications, kind of broad applications for uh, for PTFE-based materials, uh, high heat, high impact uh, processes. Um, they make great uh, throttles for air seals. They make great uh, bearing protection, um, wonderful bushings, uh, as well as uh, all the FDA um, uh, FDA materials of the same. So th these these materials can be FDA. Uh, as well. So we'll, we'll talk about more specific applications as we get into it, but that's kind of a uh, little bit broad overview. Uh, some strengths uh, of PTFE. Um, this is first uh, just in, in its virgin state. Um, broad, very broad chemical resistance, uh, non-flammable, flexible uh, at low temperatures. So it's good for cryogenic uh, services, uh, low coefficient of friction. Uh, stable at high temperatures, relatively easy to process, and it's also hydrofluoric acid uh, resistance. Um, some of those weaknesses uh, of PTFE, um, as you may know, creep and cold flow, it, it tends to, uh, to move uh, and relax over time, stress relief and move under pressure. Uh, relatively soft, um, low thermal dissipation. PTFE likes to hold on to heat and keep it, um, which can be a problem for heat, heat buildup. 
uh, poor dimensional stability, uh, high material shrinkage, low rigidity, and low electrical conductivity. So what we do then is we, we understand PTFE's inherent strengths, and then we add fillers uh, to it uh, to bolster those weaknesses and then um, you know, uh, create uh, a, a, better, a better material that, that can be used in a, in a wider range of applications. So that's, that's um, what we're gonna get into next. Hey, Cody, real quick. Yes. Um, um, Martin just jumped in with a question specific to um, PTFE and what you're talking about right now, so I thought I would sure. ask it. Yeah. And it says, what temperature will PTFE go to without dimensionally moving? Uh, so, tough question. Um, about the, the, the weird temperature at PTFE is about 78 degrees in which it actually starts doing weird things. So at, at below room temperature or at about room temperature, uh, it holds very, very true. Um, but then above 78 to 80 degrees, it starts thermally expanding. Um, and it does so up until, uh, up until it's glass transition temperature, say 300-ish, and then it's good to 550 continuous um, but PTFE moves <laughs> almost instantly above room temperature. Now we're talking about small dimensional changes, but depending on your diameter, um, yeah, P PTFE moves almost almost immediately in terms of temperature it's concerned, which is why we add fillers to it. So yeah, I mean, I hope that answers uh, answers your question, but PTFE moves a lot and at very low temperatures. <laughs> Thanks, Cody. That does. And I'll um, let you know if anything else comes in and I'll go ahead and move us to the next slide. Okay. So um, because of that and, and because of questions like that one that was just asked, uh, it's uh, almost imperative in, in many applications, most applications to add fillers to, to PTFE to help with some of those things. Carbon fiber, uh, since we're talking about wear and friction grade materials, carbon fiber is the, uh, the most common, the best material uh, to bolster uh, these wear and friction properties. So uh, specifically the carbon fiber that, that's most commonly used is a milled uh, carbon fiber. So picture like a, a tiny rod of carbon fiber, uh, typically 13 microns in diameter, uh, 20 to 30 thousandths in length. Uh, produces a black coarse finish um, similar to a glass fiber uh, material kind of rough on the exterior um, but it looks it looks like you as you would expect carbon fiber uh, to look improvements it weighs less um, with higher thermal conductivity and, and lower thermal expansion so we're going to get um, we're going to get some better thermal properties some lower thermal expansion meaning it's not going to move quite as much uh, at, at as the temperature increases uh, of course, higher compressive strength, increased hardness, increased deformation under load. And when you add carbon fiber to PTFE, it maintains its, its strong alkali and, and hydrofluoric acid resistance, whereas glass fiber uh, will, not, uh, will not do that. So uh, that's the advantage uh, of carbon fiber over, say, a fiberglass. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. Here's just some uh, just some typical properties for a wear and friction grade material um, that is pretty common. Uh, it's a material that we have and, and pretty common industry standard material. I won't get into all of the uh, the nuts and bolts of the properties. Again, you'll have this av available if you want to take a take a peek at it. But this is kind of a a baseline solid wear and friction grade um, properties. Um, a few things to note is deformation under load is very low uh, on this particular material as a result of a carbon fiber, less than 1%. And uh, the coefficient of lineal thermal expansion. Uh, so that was the question that you just had. Uh, what does it do? What does the material do in, in, when, it, uh, when temperature rises? Uh, this one is, is, this particular material is, um, the carbon fiber bolsters that and makes it, makes it much, much better. So as comparison to, um, uh, a virgin PTFE, this is a third of that thermal expansion. Um, so yeah, you can, you can take, a, take a peek at that uh, at your leisure. Uh, but some broad applications uh, of these wear and friction grade materials, uh, air seals, the, the throttle uh, for an air, air seal, uh, bearing isolators, but really any, 
any material where there's um, metal mating surfaces or the, the components are going to be rubbing together, um, this is a fantastic uh, wear and friction material. So uh, even even things like um, uh, piston rings and stuff, but this would be an option. Uh, so glass filled uh, PTFE, uh, common industry standard material glass filled PTFE. Uh, it, it offers improved dimensional stability when compared to standard PTFE. Now, this material also has good wear and friction properties. Uh, cold flow resistance, low deformation under load when compared to other materials. So if you imagine, I used a, I used a uh, concrete uh, <laughs> example earlier. Uh, if you imagine um, concrete slab without rebar in it at all, uh, over time that concrete is going to want to move when you put load on it. It's going to uh, expand, it's going to squish, it's going to flow. That's essentially what cold flow is, um, and you're going to develop cracks and weak points in the material. So glass-filled PTFE is the glass fibers, is essentially rebar in, in the concrete. It creates a uh, overlapping mesh within the material. Um, that prevents that cold flow. It obviously adds strength and structure to the material, but it also holds everything together. It creates this interlocking web within the within the polymer that resists it um, flowing. It, it resists it wanting to relax over time and move. Um, so as a result of that, uh, uh, glassful PTFE is, is good for compression applications. Um, and, and I think we'll talk about that. So we have valve seats, um, where it, where it's like a ball valve seat, for instance, um, a gasket, uh, flange gasket, uh, we, we see quite a bit, uh, bushings, spacers, and even lantern rings that are under load um, because the, those glass fiber matrix is going to resist that uh, that cold flow. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's glass filled PTFE. Industry standard material has been around for a long time, but it is still a staple um, a staple in the industry. So um yeah uh, strengths ptfe uh glass fill ptfe as i said good dimensional stability um it will re resist that thermal expansion not quite as much as a carbon fiber material but it is uh, certainly uh, much much better than virgin uh, that cold flow resistance you get that lower deformation under load uh, and increased wear and friction and increased hardness so that is uh yeah that's glass fill ptfe uh, the the best friend of glass of glass uh, fiberglass material uh, is millennium disulfide, commonly called Molly. It I'll, I'll say it's uh, it's it's the tag team. Uh, it's the best friend of fiberglass. It's almost uh, it's almost always uh, the the two work together. Um, you hardly see Molly without fiberglass, even though sometimes you see uh, you see fiberglass without Molly. But Molly improves hardness. Um, it lowers the coefficient of friction, so it increases that wear performance, whereas you add the fiberglass for strength. And now you get the, uh, the molly coming in that adds, um, adds some lubricity, adds some lower coefficient of friction. Uh, so it's ideal for those dynamic uh, sealing applications, uh, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, so again, it improves that uh, Coefficient of, fr oh, coefficient of friction by reducing it. Molly is very slick. It's a very slick filler. Increases those hardness, increases those wear properties uh, when married with and combined uh, with fiberglass. So we see primarily Molly glass PTFE is used for uh, Chevron V packing sets, uh, spring energized seals, and even wedge seals. Uh, if y'all are familiar with the uh, Palmetto, I think has a uh, has a wedge seal, um, it, then that's that's fiber, fiberglass and molly um, be, because it, it can run well, both dry and lubricated, um, and it's just it's just a great it's just a great dynamic uh, wear wear material. So the next one we talk about uh, again another industry standard material carbon graphite filled PTFE. Uh, well suited for high temperature, high wear applications, uh, has self lubricating properties uh, as a result of of that graphite um, that's in there. So and um, and it dissipates heat very quickly. So high temperature applications like soot blower set packing um, is almost exclusively a carbon graphite uh, filled material. Uh, piston seals, 
uh, especially in uh, low or uh, non-lubed applications. We see carbon graphite a lot out in West, uh, West Texas for piston rings um, and even lip seals. Uh, because of the combination between uh, the carbon and the graphite, you get a very low coefficient of friction that dissipates heat very quickly. Um, so, and, and that is because of the improvements that carbon and graphite add, um, which is that it adds lower creep resistance, even at high temperatures, as well as low temperatures, increase the thermal conductivity. So that's that heat dissipation that we want in a, in a dynamic sealing application. We want the seal, uh, to get rid of the heat as quickly as it can um, and, and, and at the same time be a, uh, a hard, uh, well-wearing material, uh, which, is what, uh, which is what carbon graphite does. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, so bronze uh, filled PTFE, again, another um, pretty common uh, industry standard material, improved wear resistance and really, really good thermal conductivity, as you imagine, 40 or 60% bronze filled PTFE, it's going to dissipate that heat very quickly, um, which is why we primarily see this, this material as a wear band uh, material, where it's going to see a lot, of, a lot of frictional heat and a lot of wear. Um, it's good for bearings. It's good for bushings. Um, we see this in like uh, big bearings for pillow blocks. Um, or almost exclusively uh, when they're P when PTFE is used, uh, it's going to be a bronze filled uh, PTFE. Um, yep, because it's uh, that high high thermal conductivity, high creep resistance, increased hardness, so you get overall increased wear performance as a result of of that. So uh, final PTFE based material I think we're going to talk about is this metal detectable uh, material. This is particularly important in food and beverage industry. Uh, this uh, particular material can be uh, identified by metal detectors. So if a piece of the material comes off, uh, metal, metal, metal detectors will, will pick it up. So uh, we've got a little video, uh, I think that Lori can pull yep. up and show us. I'm gonna launch it now and press play and excuse us for a little transition, everybody. And y'all can watch the video and we'll be right back. Thanks, Cody. Hopefully we will be, we are back to the slides and we can go to the next one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that, that metal detectable material is a, uh, a, uh, a good option for uh, it, poultry processing plants, uh, food beverage industry. I know that on the poll question, there was some people there that were, um, uh, that were in the food and beverage industry, uh, dairy industry out in West Texas, we, we see that um, uh, th this metal detectable material for like clamp plate gaskets and those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, it, it's a it's a good material. Um, st still maintains all of the um, uh, all of the great performance uh, characteristics that you get of PTFE, uh, all the chemical resistance, all that kind of stuff. But it's uh, it can be detected uh, by a metal detector. Uh, Lori, I do not see the slide anymore. Um, can you hear me, Lori? Ah, there we go. Uh, okay, so uh, if everybody can see this, now we're on to um, uh, metal, uh, sorry, uh, PET materials. Um, let me get this back up. Sorry. Uh, okay. Um, so PET uh, is a uh, non-PTFE based material. Obviously, we're moving on to a different polymer. Um, this would be uh, for you guys who know um, vesconite uh, materials or thordon materials. This is not specifically a, a um, their materials, obviously, but this is in that family of materials. So these are 
um, lower temperature uh, rated materials, lower um, lower chemically resistant materials, uh, but they are uh, ideally suited for these dry running applications. They have some internal lubrication in them. These are very, very hard materials. Um, so they are great for, uh, for bushings and bearings, um, like vertical turbine pump bushings. Um, but because these materials um, have a very narrow chemical resistance, as you can see in that um, in the weakness category there, um, they're they're very narrow in their in their applications. So these would not be suitable for um, any type of harsh chemical service or any any type of uh, service where temperature is above, uh, say, 200 to 210 degrees. But anything below that and anything that is wastewater or it's uh, just you know low low to no chemical service these 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 materials are great uh, very strong very rigid great dimensional stability very low coefficient of friction they're hydrophobic meaning they're not going to absorb water over time so they're good for underwater applications very easy to machine they're fda approved so these are uh, the workhorse of that um, kind of uh, non-chemical lower temperature uh, applications. Uh, here you see just some technical data um, on this material in particular, which is a internally lubricated uh, dry running uh, material. Um, yeah, I won't spend a ton of time, but you can see co uh, coefficient of uh, linear thermal expansion is pretty good um, for, what this, um, for what this material is. Uh, very hard, great tensile strength. Um, this is just a really, really good dry running um, uh, material for those, those kind of applications, like vertical turbine pump bushings. Um, but doesn't have to be um, only those those applications. Anything in the uh, wastewater, any bushing in in those kind of services, um, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful material. So now we're going to move on um to some more high performance materials we kind of walked through the ptfe which those are probably common to everybody on um then we move into those kind of lower service uh, pet applications and now we're moving into uh really the high higher performance materials more costly materials but also uh kind of a step up in in what they what they can do uh, pps offers superior dimensional stability and improved temperature resistance excellent bearing performance so getting back to that question that was asked about ptfe you know changing dimensions um, as it as it increases in temperature uh, pps based materials do not do that they hold their, they hold their dimensions um, up into i mean they, they do expand a little bit but for the most part this is going to hold its temperature up into its you know 500 550 f um, so yeah let's go to the next slide uh, some applications for this uh, of course, bearings, bushings, lantern rings, any any type of application where we're looking at uh, really harsh chemicals, really high temperature, where you need something that's just going to be solid, uh, you know, and give you good wear performance as well. Uh, so some advantage or some uh, specifics about uh, PPS. Really, there's two kinds of, of PPS, and this will be a little, a little technical in terms of uh, what we're talking about here, but I think this is good information uh, for you guys to know. Um, there's really two two different types of PPS. There's linear uh, PPS, which is long linear molecular chains. So linear, think about it that like that, linear molecular chains, similar to what you would see with, with PTFE. Um, so linear PPS is higher tensile strength and higher elongation, really good. Uh, melt stability, meaning it doesn't do weird things when it melts, uh, less prone to absorbing moisture because of these long molecular chains that it has, it has much less uh, void content as opposed to its branched uh, brother. Uh, better impact resistance, it's not as brittle, uh, so it in turn has better impact resistance. The other side of that is there are branched forms uh, of, um, of PPS, which have high rigidity. They're very hard materials, much harder, not much harder, but harder than the linear versions. Um, 
really, really good dimensional stability, uh, inc improved uh, creep resistance, but they are more difficult to process. Uh, they generally, these branched versions generally require pre-curing, they require cross-linking, um, and they are almost almost always much more brittle. Uh, so at impact, they will, they will break. Um, so some of just the generic strengths of, of PPS, excellent chemical and radiation resistance, excellent water absorption, really good dimensional stability, superior abrasion resistance, and their continuous use up to 450. That's kind of a conservative uh, number. They can really go up, up above that, to even up to 550 continuous use, um, but they're, they're considered a, a really high temp material. Again, some of those weaknesses, uh, they can be brittle. PPS materials are, tend to be very brittle, uh, especially the branched version. Uh, poor resistance to chlorinated hydrocarbons like vinyl chloride and chloromethane. They are higher cost and they're more challenging uh, to process. So you have to weigh that cost benefit um, and, uh, and make that determination. So yeah, that's PPS. Um, and just like with uh, PTFE and with the PET we talked about, um, adding fillers to it can, can offset or can augment or, or improve some of those, um, uh, some of those inherent uh, deficiencies. So uh, graphite is, is a material that's often added to, to PPS. Um, from a technical standpoint, um, this is a, graphite is a crystalline modification of, of a high purity carbon. Uh, less than 75 microns. Um, this is a, like a flat picture, like a sheet of paper, essentially, is what, what a, a tiny sheet of paper is what graphite is. Um, so it's very slick, it's very shiny. Um, and what it does when added to PPS is it's going to further reduce that coefficient of friction. It's going to increase uh, thermal conductivity. Um, as you as you can imagine, when these tiny little sheets of graphite are all stacked upon one another, it gives the heat a way to get out. Um, it, it increases hardness, increased wear property, uh, displays high load capability in high speed, high contact applications. Uh, so PPS um, with graphite, again, broad chemical resistance, um, non-flammable, flexible at low temperatures, very low coefficient of friction, stable at high temperatures, uh, easy to, relatively easy to process, um, Good, good creep and cold flow. Uh, sorry, the creep and cold flow is a little bit um, um, diminished on this particular uh, one. But let's go to uh, the next slide, and we'll talk about a little bit of applications for this. Uh, so, yeah, quick technical data on um, on PPS and graphite. Um, this is kind of a bearing grade. Uh, go back one slide, Laura, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, this is a um, bearing grade uh, PPS material. Um, again, you can just look over this in, in your in your own time, but um, really good uh, low coefficient of thermal expansion on this one. So yeah, t take a peek at that uh, when you can. But that's that's a quick data sheet on our bearing grade PPS. So some applications uh, for uh, for this uh, this material because it um, it's really good, really stable at at, uh, at higher temperatures, and because of that lower coefficient coefficient of friction and because it's very hard it can maintain a, a very high bearing load it's really good for bushings bushings and bearings um, in these um, packing system components so uh, hydro load applications where you replace uh, a couple of the rings of packing with the PPS bushing in the bottom of the box um, fantastic material uh, this is primarily what that's used for uh, but it's good for lantern rings as well in high temp uh, applications high performance applications, maybe even higher speed applications. Um, that's where we see uh, PPS materials with graphite and carbon and, and, and uh, the fillers and those kind of bearing grade applications. So that is, uh, that's PPS. So now it takes us to um, one of the last materials we're gonna talk about, which is uh, PBI. Uh, not, not nearly as well known of a material, um, but uh, PBI is a high temp polymer and we say high temp we're talking 650 plus um, so this is the preferred material for these really really high temp uh, applications and and it too can have uh, fillers added to it which is what we're going to talk about uh, specifically adding peak to it so we'll go to the next slide here 
Um, so yeah, some high, quick applications for, for PPI, getting high temp, uh, high wear, um, um, bushings and seals uh, and such. Uh, strengths of, of PBI, uh, it's the highest compressive strength of any unfilled resin. So this is the high, strongest material of, of anything uh, that's out there right now. Excellent tensile strength, excellent flex strength. It's very dimensionally stable, uh, almost no creep, um, uh, low coefficient of friction, and it, it can be continuously used uh, really 800. We're, we're being conservative with our numbers, but it, uh, it is a very high temp material. It, it can be a little bit brittle, um, and, and it's, it's more expensive. Uh, it's, in fact, quite expensive, but uh, in these higher, higher uh, temperature applications, it's, it's a fantastic material. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So they, um, as good as that material is, it can be made even better with the with the addition of of peak. So we're going to talk just for a minute about peak, which is a material that that you all I'm sure are familiar with. But um, peak is its own base uh, material, uh, and it can be used as a standalone product. But it also works very well when when used in combination with PBI and other uh, other polymers as a as a filler. Um, Peak maintains that high flexibility. It has excellent temperature resistance, really, really good dimensional uh, stability. Uh, some applications for just for Peak specifically, um, backup rings because of its ability to, to handle high pressure, um, high temperature lantern rings because it can hold up to be 600 degrees or so. Uh, it Peak is FDA uh, approved, so demanding uh, you know, these really rigorous FDA applications, um, Peak is an absolutely uh, wonderful choice. Uh, and it, had, uh, it has really good chemical resistance as well, even better so than PTFE. So those tough chemical applications, uh, Peak, is, uh, Peak is great. Um, again, excellent, excellent tensile strength, excellent elongation, really good wear properties, really good chemical resistance. I mean, it is just, um, it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic material. It's not suitable, however, for nitric sulfuric acid. It is more costly and it can be, um, can be difficult to process. Um, so yeah, here's a, um, just some data on a, uh, on a PBI and peak uh, high performance material. Again, I won't, won't spend a ton of time on this, but when you combine that really high performance PBI material with peak as, a, as an additive, the two together make a, an extremely, uh, extremely hard, uh, just a wonderful material for high temp applications. So we're, um, we're seeing this material being primarily used in these really high temp um, uh, Sorry, you can go to the next slide, Lori. Uh, really high temp bushings. Um, so so blowers, uh, if you need a, a you know a high temp um, bearing or bushing um, in those applications, it's great. Um, there's there's a lot of different applications that we're seeing this in, but uh, anything above say 550 to 600 degrees um, in steam applications as well, where you're um, where, where anything else, including peak, would fail, this material is um, is fantastic. Um, so I think that's about all of the materials that we're we're looking at this morning. We're um, the advantage uh, of of what we're doing here uh, of this complete and vertical integration because we uh, here at Sepco do uh, in-house blending PTFE. We do compression molding. Uh, we CNC turning, CNC milling. Um, you know. We as a company are, are um, vertically, vertically integrated in that regard, but um, that's uh, that's about all uh, I think we have uh, for specific topics of uh, discussion there on materials. But absolutely, I'm sure there's questions. I'm happy to uh, to spend. We got 10, 15 minutes um, talking about uh, talking about plastics, whatever whatever uh, you guys want to talk about. Yeah, thank you so much. So much information packed into that presentation. So thank you very much. Um, um, a question that came in just a minute ago, um, and if you can't answer it right now, we can get back to them. It says, explain gamma radiation. Oh, gamma radiation. Uh, yeah, that, that's a question I'll have to, I'll have to get back. <laughs> get okay. Back well, I mean, 
a lot of uh, a lot of products are irradiated. Um, like for instance, uh, PTFE uh, itself is irradiated to. Um, so P some of you might know that PTFE nothing sticks uh, to PTFE. Uh, so in order to allow PTFE to stick to objects, so to be glued to, um, you know, a, a metal surface. It has to be irradiated, so they blast it with uh, gamma radiation that changes the surface of the material <clears throat> slightly, um, that allows it to be able to kind of etches it, allows it to be able to stick to to product. So in that process, um, you know, you, yeah, I'm assuming there is seals and applications for that, um, but that's more or less what they use gamma radiation for in in, in, the, in industries that I know. Um, but I'm sure that it's used. <laughs> I'm sure it's used elsewhere in other industrial applications. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much for answering that. Um, so you talk about some of the um, the. I'm going to look at the slide here. I think it's P. It's before P. The, is it PBI? That's that's kind of expensive. Or yeah. in some of the other higher grade materials, are yeah. there lower cost alternatives that that are available? or that can be used in, in their places or as a as a way to yeah. save a little money and still have protection yeah, yeah. i mean that's uh that's a good that's a good question um yeah the answer is yes there's always uh, always lower cost options specifically we, we we come across that with um with, with more of the wear and friction grade materials like that first material we talked about um which we primarily use for uh, throttle materials or bearing protectors, uh, EXPs. Um, it, it is a somewhat of a high cost material and, and there's always um, lower cost options. Um, we, we don't necessarily want to always over engineer um, everything. If something else, um, say a carbon graphite filled PTFE would work just as good, um, then yeah, I mean, we are not uh, certainly not opposed to um, uh, stepping things down a little bit. If, if you don't need a Cadillac and, and a Ford Taurus will do, will tell you, will get you where you're going, then that's uh, that's what you want to use. So yeah, there there are some other options uh, in the, in terms of uh, the high temp materials. Um, it's just a, just a matter of what what that max temperature is. I mean, PTFE and PPS and even peak. Um, they're, they're still considered high temp materials. Um, so if you're, if you're in that six, 550 to 600 degree range, um, those materials will, st will still work fine. So you don't necessarily need to step up to those, to that PBI based material, unless you absolutely, uh, unless you absolutely have to, because like with anything else, there is a, uh, cost to benefit uh, analysis, you know, there's a, there's a, right. there's a, a point at which it doesn't make much sense anymore to, to continue to stepping up that price if it doesn't, if you don't need those extra benefits. Well, and, and working with a provider, a material provider that can add the different fillers and things, there may be some options there as well, I assume with adding a filler that would strengthen a less expensive material and, and, you know, provide, you know, adequate uh, protection and, and equipment mm -hmm. in the equipment. Yeah, and, that, and that's one of the benefits of working with somebody who is, who is vertically integrated, who can make those, um, who can make those recommendations and kind of has the flexibility to, to alter some materials, maybe to cater a material specifically, um, you know, to solve a problem in the lowest cost, um, best option, um, and it's not relied on you know, is not relying on um, just, you know, a kind of a, a more narrow um, option of materials, so, you know, having, having some more flexibility there. Great. Um, another question just came through. Have you used Niloil, N-Y-L-O-I-L, on some seals? What's your take on that material? Yeah, so I, I don't know much about it other than I, I'm assuming it's uh, it's a nylon that's uh, internally lubricated uh, with with something. I think we have used it. We 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 don't we don't specifically go into a lot of the um, uh, I'll say commodity plastics. I mean, we we do machine them. Um, so this would be like nylons. Um, 
you know, nylatrons, UHMWs, all those kinds of materials. Uh, we stock them, we machine them, not, not necessarily our specialty. Um, but I mean, I don't have anything against <laughs> nylon, certainly. I, it's, a, it's a good material, um, very hard. Uh, it, nylon, the, the issue with nylon is that it, it's, it's not hydrophobic, meaning it, it does absorb water and it absorbs a lot of water. So over time, it's going to, uh, it's going to swell. Um, so uh, we, we typically stay away from nylon in any, any kind of bearing or sealing application. Um, just because there's better, there's better options that, that really aren't that much, that much more expensive. Um, but as an external, you know, as a housing or as a, a plug or maybe even like a, a wear pad, um, I, I think, yeah, I think nylon, um, w would be, uh, would be a, a good option there. Absolutely. And one question that came in via email, um, earlier, because we did encourage folks if they had some questions to go ahead and send them in, um, was if you could run through kind of the maximum temperatures roughly for the major, you know, base materials, that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I'll, You've done uh, that song, but. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be conservative when I say these and I'll try to, I'll try to uh, tier them so that, um, so that there is some differ differentiation between the materials because they do kind of, there is some overlap. So if you, if you, kind of keep it in its simplest form, PTFE uh, is 450F. Um, again, it is a little bit higher, but for simplicity purposes, P PTFE is 450F, uh, PPS, polyphenylene sulfide, and, and, its, uh, and its composite materials are 500F, uh, PEAK and its composites 550F, and, uh, and then the PBI is basically 700 plus. So that's kind of the tier. And again, there is overlap. And, and when you add different fillers, it kind of changes some of that, but that's your rule of thumb. That's the rule of thumb that, that I generally go by 450 for PTFE, 500 for PPS, 550 for peak, and then 700 plus is gonna be a PBI or, or it's derivative. So there's a lot of different materials on the market that are those kinds. So Vespel may be a name that you've heard of, um, those are those high performance, uh, sorry, high temperature materials. So 700 ish plus. Awesome. And we have one last question, unless we get more that come in. So, um, for wear and friction materials, um, so comparing what you do with the in other materials like that in the industry, where, where does, um, the material you talked about today stand compared to other industry? Producers. Yeah, so we're uh, almost all the materials I talked about are fairly industry standard materials that you can get, you know, anywhere. <laughs> um, but some of the materials that are specific to, you know, to us um, are our um, our wear and friction material, um, our uh, bearing grade PPS materials, our peak materials. Um, again, there there are. Um, specific to our company but they're um they're very comparable um in terms of chemistry and certainly in performance with, with everything else um with everything else that's out there uh we like we like to think we're a little better but <laughs> but of in course. all honesty they're they're uh you know uh performance plastics everybody everybody has has their thing uh every company you go to has something that they that they're promoting as differentiating themselves. Uh, and, and some of them are, are differentiating. Some of them are different uh, in some ways. But generally speaking, um, if you apply those principles that we kind of, you know, quickly talked about, um, you know, improving those base polymers with specific fillers catered to those specific applications, be it increased wear performance or, uh, you know, you need better deformation under load characteristics or better creep resistance or, you know, if you take the proper base polymer for the application and you apply those fillers um, uh, to, en to enhance those deficiencies of that, of that base polymer, you're going to end up with a material that will work very well uh, for that application. So whether you, whether you color it green and call it this or that, or you, you know, add a little bit of this or that, you know, those are all those tiny differentiating things. 
but at the end of the day, um, it's more about sound application. It's more about understanding the, the process, uh, understanding the qualities of the base resins and those fillers and, the, and then applying those, um, applying those properly, which is what we do. Um, and of course, uh, why we feel like we can stand behind uh, our materials. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much again, um, folks. You've seen the slide up here. You can contact Cody at his email address or give him a call and um, or catch up with him on LinkedIn. If you have any questions, please reach out, out to him. And um, please be um, looking for an email with the recording of the webinar and the slide deck. And in November, um, we will be presenting a webinar on Mechanical Seals 101. It's gonna dive into the basics of what a mechanical seal is, how to install them, how to decide what you, whether you need a single or a double seal. So it'll be a great primer on mechanical seals. And Cody, thank you again so much for presenting. Absolutely. We appreciate it. Absolutely. And um, we, we'll talk to you guys later. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.